Morning. How are we? Hey, Aaron, have you got your shirt on backwards? <laughs> I like the assumption, Jack, that I'm just totally incompetent. <laughs> but no, this was, this came with the, the hoodies that I finally picked up. Oh, cool, but cool. The logo is massive. Yeah, it looks like it should be on the back. <laughs> well, it is as well. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, how are you? Good. It's my four-year-old's birthday this morning. I saw that. All, and yeah. it's certainly exponential. The first year of her life when people would say it's going to go quick, it's like this is not going quick. This is taking forever. This is horrendous. <laughs> but actually it's an exponential growth curve and, yeah, it's, it's scary. It is really scary how fast it goes. I, I look at photos of my kids from a year ago and they've grown a good foot. And my son's voice is just starting, it's actually dropped. And it, it's so bizarre. There's no, where did the last 12 years go? It just feels so quick now. What have you been up to, Jack? Just still in Adelaide. Just caught up with some mates watching the, the grand finals on the weekend. Has your team won anything yet? Any team that you barrack for? Or are you still on the weekend? The Lions lost and then the Broncos oh, okay. lost. Yeah. But it was a great weekend of sport. Like they were both really good grand finals. Something had happened out at the farm with the Telstra connection, but I fired up the Starlink for the first time. And it actually, it's, I've always said he's a wonderful guy. That <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm supporting Elon Musk. There you go. I like the that surprise that it worked. <laughs> It was four times quicker than what I get at home. So we live streamed from the middle of nowhere the events and my wife's family are all AFL crazy. So the farm got converted into AFL supporter territory. So yeah. I love it. All, all right. right. Let's get into some news. Where should we kick off? Yeah. I, I was keen to share a session I was in a couple of weeks back. So th this was a round table discussion of some uni students and academics on AI in the classroom. And what came out a couple of things came out of that. So number one, 90 plus percent of uni students are using things like chat GPT to do assignments and on the one hand to draw inspiration and ideas for their assignments, but also for learning. And they're actually saying they, they learn more using chat GPT than listening to some of their lectures. They don't know um, if it's right or if it's correct. No. They, they learn a lot. Yeah. And look, if they're on the free version, the information's dated and all other things and carries biases. But the fact that yeah, one thing in particular was a lot of the students are using chat GPT as their search instead of Google. So some of them said, we, we just don't use Google. We go straight to chat GPT. And they were frustrated because for some units, they're not allowed to use any AI tools in the classroom. There's policies against. In fact, they actually have tools now to detect if chat GPT is being used. Also in the IT students, so that the computer science students and, and those learning programming, those in second year had come through an era of second year onwards had come through an era of no chat GPT allowed, no AI tools. And the first year students are actually being taught how to use those tools to code. And, and so there was a lot of discussion about what is the role of universities and, and how does education transform in teaching these skills? Because the reality is the students are using them. And so, yeah, what is the future of education in, a, in an AI enabled world? And also as all these students hit the market as consumers, like what, how's that going to impact what businesses need to deliver as well? Yeah. For me, I'm reminded by that old Steve Jobs video where he talks about when he was a kid, he was fascinated about what are the fastest animals and, and humans were pretty low, but you put a human on a bike and it can go faster than anything else. And, and for me, it's a similar analogy for AI tools and I think what we're going to find is those that can learn how to harness it and use it properly are going to beat the people who aren't. And it's mm. the same with our portfolio. I, th I think we're ending up in a situation where we're more looking at who's able to harness and use AI rather than trying to pick the actual application winner or the, the AI winner. And so for me, yes, I can understand why the university system wants to be able to control and, and evaluate your own skills, but actually what's valuable to companies is actually people that can use it. So the earlier they can get the best out of it, the better. Yeah. It was interesting. Peter Domendez had a little reel from a podcast interview where he was talking about the future of software engineers and, and software companies. And he was saying, it's all about, it's going to be about understanding the user requirements. That'll be the key piece. And then 
The rest will be almost managing the AI tools and how the information flows and more of that systems architecture, like high level, bigger picture type stuff. But, but yeah, I, I think chatting to some of the portfolio companies and the, having to have their finger on the pulse of AI because they need to be across it to understand how it's going to change their, their industry and potentially impact them and, and how they can leverage it. So we, with this podcast, we obviously create some content and then what we want to try and do is create some short versions of it, one minute to five minutes so people don't have to be bored out of their mind for an hour. And so there are AI tools popping up that say, hey, we'll go into the file and we'll look for your most engaging content. Mm. Now, what it actually turns out is that the AI is trained that engagement is around laughter. And what happens is it makes these short clips that are engaging, but it doesn't know which bits prior to that interesting bit to actually include. So the, a lot of the clips that it's made actually has no context, no reference and of little value. So it's, those tools are interesting, but there's still a way to go before it's actually properly usable. Yeah. It's interesting. Like you know, listening to radio, I always hear the DJs, they laugh at the end of every sentence. And it's almost become a, a stylistic thing to make something sound more interesting, just to use laughter. For me, I use, I have bloody nervous laughter. So I'd be really yeah. worried about what the AI tools pull out as interesting. And just to be clear, when I laugh, it's, I'm laughing at you, not with you. <laughs> Mate, you make that clear all the time. So that's good. <laughs> so Jack, you graduated uni only a few years ago. Yeah. What have you seen from where you are? today versus where you were only a few years ago in law? When we're trying to compare, should AI be allowed to be used in university? It's still, you go back to should open book versus closed book. Like right now you're still doing closed book exams because they've got to have an exam to test the students. So I don't really know, is the goal of university to get a student ready to work in the workforce or is it just to examine you to get you a grade? Like it's hard to justify what they're trying to do there. Or is it to find a whole lot of people willing to fork out the dollars to keep the university open so then that way all the bureaucrats can stay employed? Oh, sorry, I blanked out. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a hard one because they're still doing closed book exams and that's not the real world, right? It's very different yeah. now. It's a good point, Jack. What is the value of knowledge versus the skill of finding truth in information or patterns in information? I think in a world where we can get the instant access to information, I think the skill is not so much in knowledge learning, but in the ability to navigate what, and particularly with generative AI, what is real, what is fake, what, what is you know, accurate, what, what is the meaningful insight to be taken from information. I think those skills are way more valuable going forward. Yeah, I use ChatGPT on a regular basis, mostly for copy editing. Like it's so handy just to whack it into chat GPT and just get it to edit just so all the like grammatical errors are fixed and then you can just carry on. It just saves that time. Is this how you find all those mistakes in all the reports that don't know right? <laughs> yeah, <blog post. laughs> uh, but but um, it is, as any listener of this podcast will know and my teammates know that my brain has moved on quite often before my mouth has had time to finish the sentence. <laughs> or I'll even admit words in the middle of the sentence because it's just buzzing around inside there. And so often I'm far more coherent in the written form because I can actually just spend a little bit of time, get the ideas out. No, that's not what I meant to say. And there's a big difference between spoken Don sometimes and written Don. Now with some of these in the edit, what I'm looking forward to is if I've missed a word or like even editing the last episode, somehow we end up talking about me and my four mowers. But the whole point of that original discussion that's missed is that we were talking about summer, how hot it was raining. In my mind, that leads to grass. I live on 15 acres. I have a lot of grass. Like, <laughs> like, but when you edit that whole episode together, it's like randomly Don's talking about his mowers. Like what? So it would have been, it would have been good <laughs> again. <laughs> It would have been good with the little AI tool just to type in there and it looks and sounds like Don, so Don doesn't sound like a lunatic that just randomly <laughs> comes up with rubbish. Yeah, no, I totally relate to that though. I often say something and it, they, I skipped all these other thoughts and points. And one of the things that I sent to you guys 
a little while ago, but it's probably just relevant here, of how you can use those tools even today to try and get a better result. I might just play this little TikTok video because I think it. I think this is the way the world's heading, and the more investors and founders can get on board with with that. Can you see something up there? Yeah, it's coming up now. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see a screen now, Don. I gave GPT-4 a budget of $100 and said, I will act as your human liaison. I will do things in the real world or I will do things on the internet you tell me to. I want you to make as much money as possible in as short a time as possible. So interestingly enough, what winds up happening is the Twitter thread that this guy posts about the GPT-4 thing goes viral. Yeah. And as GPT-4 is beginning to respond and it has this whole idea for affiliate marketing websites, but a company reaches out and wants to get an ad in the Twitter thread. Yeah. And so they make $1,000 or some amount of money yeah. from this company. And this guy tells GPT-4, hey, we made money this way. And he starts to get more and more attention. And, yeah. and now GPT-4, in combination with this guy, has turned that $100 into over $7,000. And it's from sponsorship. And he's like telling GPT-4 about all of this and saying, what should we do? How should we interact with these sponsors? How should we think about the ads being in our Twitter feed? And they're even getting featured on CNN. And so he's asking GPT-4, what talking points should I have for our CNN segment? So he's interacting to fuel these choices, these logic tree decisions, and it's actually working. I think, first of all, fascinating. Yeah. But I also wonder how many more experiments we're going to get like this, where someone gives like a set of constraints yeah. to GPT-4 and says, here are the constraints, but here's what I want you to achieve achieved its goal yeah just by being gpt4 so that that to me it's only a very small kind of example human plus a tool now that there's actually that interaction there's almost that iterative process that ended up with the result yeah. that he wanted yeah it's incredibly interesting and we're really just at at the starting point of, of this so where it heads next is, is going to be fascinating particularly as more data sets get bought in and yeah these systems start learning and, and this leads nicely into some news from last week too. Elon Musk's Neuralink was approved for human trials. So this is planting essentially chips into our brains and into our heads as a human computer interface. I, I will use the Starlink. <laughs> it will be a cold day in hell before I let that lunatic implant anything. <laughs> uh, so, Don, I'm Robot picking up. Taxis, auto driving is going to be here four years ago. Hello. In the tech adoption diffusion curve, Don's the laggard on Elon Musk generated technology. But, but yeah, no, human, human trials. So it's a small, from what I've read, probably a relatively small trial, like less than 10 people, but starting to actually embed these chips in and looking at who else is working in this space. There's a number of companies that are pretty well funded that, that are doing similar things out of Switzerland, out of Australia. Some are claiming to tackle psychological conditions, mental health. Others are looking at things like Alzheimer's. Some are looking to augment reality <laughs> in terms of overlays of information. Given Musk is, is behind this one, it's super interesting where it's going to, going to go next. I just think the, the world isn't catching up with these types of conversations from an ethics perspective, or even with the unis like we were talking about before. Like they're grappling with chat GPT and here we are talking about embedding computer chips and augmenting reality into our into our very minds. I think it's about trying to create rails to run on. And as long as we understand that it's going to be human plus the tech, which has been what it's been like for tens of thousands of years, right? Starting yeah. with stones and moving, moving up. And even as a parent with my kids, I've got this constant fight of personally, I want them outside. I want them out there playing. I want them falling out of trees. I want them building cubby houses. I don't want them on their iPads, and but I've got to be very careful because of the way the world is heading. I've got to make sure that they are able to hold their own. And when you watch some of the games and some of the tools that are coming out, you can see as, as long as it's not the tip, TikTok K-hole and Insta K-hole that their father can sometimes fall into, it is very important that they end up with those skills. Yeah. I think switching a little bit, the other news just out today, actually, is the latest Cut Through Ventures quarterly report investment data. It was a fascinating report. Uh, yeah. So I love reading these quarterly reports and updates, like really well done how they put it together, capturing the investment data for the quarter, but also the, 
surveys of VCs to capture sentiment looking forward as well. But we probably should just give some key highlights from it, some key takeaways. So quarter three saw $730 million of capital raised across 77 deals. What was interesting is that Climate Tech was right up there with the most number of deals and also capital raised. FinTech has been up there for a while, but Climate Tech was followed by e-commerce and B2B SaaS. So they were the top three categories. What's interesting is total capital is tracking pretty much identical to 2020. So this entire calendar year so far has been tracking very close to 2020 numbers. I think the other key takeaway for me in this quarter was the, the sub $5 million rounds had dropped dramatically. So back to 2019 levels and Don's pulling up some of the data there. Yeah. So there's the total capital raise. So tracking back to where it was pre COVID. So a little blip is out of the way. Yeah. The smaller rounds you were saying, Aaron. Yeah. So smaller rounds sub five mil have, have dropped dramatically. So back to 2019 levels. Interestingly, there are no deals over the hundred million dollar level in this quarter either. Rounds, yes, of interestingly valuations. So in terms of what investors expect for the next quarter, 72% believe valuations will stay where they are. 28% believe they would drop. And then it was a tiny percent that thought valuations would, would increase. I do wonder if this is investors just wishing and trying to manifest, but that the overall sentiment is things next quarter will likely stay pretty similar to this quarter. Yeah, it was just interesting that the seed fell 32%. A and B, 36% and C, 41%. So the bigger the business site. So. Yeah. I found this next one, the shifts in polarity, sorry, in popularity, interesting. Just the way from Q4 2022 through to Q3 2023, enterprise and business software, which is really the vertical we, we concentrate, started in number three position, then number two position is, and ended up in number one position. So obviously a bit of competition there. There's no surprises. Crypto and blockchain ended up all the way down the bottom for three three quarters running. But then there's some variability around things like health tech, which was quite interesting. That can fluctuate. Ag tech mm -hmm. went up and then came back down again. And obviously these are just quarter on quarter uh, scenarios, but I think it's really interesting just seeing how most to least excited people were. Yeah, and particularly seeing what they're interested in or what sectors they see, you know, shifting going forward. I liked how it split out the 30th, the 30 largest deals of Q3 2023. Mm. Um, although interesting to note that they've called the deal probably when it was announced, because as Luca Neer from Safety Culture explained that that deal had been done a little while prior. Now, if we keep scrolling down, there's a couple of slides on funding to female founders. And as per usual, the female founders, especially the female only teams are well behind the male only teams. If the easiest one to look at is the median deal size by gender. Yeah. In 2023, a little bit of parity started to occur, but if you actually go back, there's a big disparity. So I guess there's a, it's good that there is some closing of that gap and some momentum, but one quarter does not make a trend. So we will have to see how that plays out. And looking at this chart, again, angel slash pre-seed, seed, and interestingly, Series B is, yeah. is trending up. However, Series A trended down. Yeah, it was interesting for me when I read the opening highlights section, it said female only founding teams had grabbed their highest percentage share since I think it was Q4 2020. But when you actually then get through to these slides and look at the detail, I think it was 3% had gone to co-founding teams where there was at least one female compared to 25% back in 2020. Then when you went deeper, there were three companies that accounted for something like 87% of that funding uh, that was going to female only teams. So yeah, I think there's some like slightly positive indicators in there, but obviously still a long way to go. And it's a long way to go and something that we all have to contribute to, right? Like it's something that we all have to play our part with. And it's something we're really conscious of and seeing the registrations coming through and the applications coming through for our own offsite in November and seeing a you know very 
high dominance of male applicants in that list. And so part of what we're looking to do is making sure that cost is an inhibitor that's preventing participating in these sort of things. So looking to fund and, and co-fund some of those places into the offsite to play out a small piece of that puzzle as well. Yeah, we had opened up registrations. We have our network, we have our portfolio. We obviously put these things through LinkedIn and just the way it's been rolling, the male representation side was high. Looking at how do we increase participation and creating spaces with without the cost. So then that way we can get more of the early stage participation that's so incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things in there was investors reporting how their portfolio companies were traveling this last quarter. And like a large number, 76% reported portfolio companies laying off up to 20% of their staff. Right. So that's quite significant. And that was up from 33% the previous quarter. So we're seeing more of the portfolio co's actually laying off staff in this last quarter than previously. And also in terms of companies being shut down, so portfolio companies closing, fewer portfolio companies closing this last quarter than the quarter before. So percent versus 9% the previous quarter. I've just, I've meant to email, let me just email this. I'll edit this out. Let me email this chart. It's just a random chart about- That's not like you done. Always love a random chart. After the, I'm just wondering how many charts Libby gets sent every day. <laughs> oh, no, when we first got together and I'd write blogs and do stuff, she said, so you, you just write and, and you just, you tell people your opinion and you, you just send that out there. I was like, yeah. So what, why, why do they listen to you? It was like, oh, that's fair enough. Is, is there any peer review? Cause she's a midwife. So it comes from the medical profession. <laughs> I was like, no, no. So no, I don't. My, my wife and I have very clear boundaries. She, I love if, it. if she heard me say that statement, she would laugh her ass off. Clear boundaries. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> she would say, if you gave him an enema, you could bury him in a matchbox. Um, <laughs> oh, far out. Hang on. Okay, it's just downloaded. Yeah, it's up now, Don. Okay. So look, the, you've got to be careful with these kinds of data sets and charts. I just found this interesting. For those listening at home, this is trucking employment as tracked on a per thousands of employees being added or reduced in the trucking industry. And the, the idea being obviously goods traveling around and being moved has some underlying relevance to general economic conditions. And what we see going back to the late 80s is that when trucking employment starts to dip, that is often the precursor to recessionary environments. And so whilst the economy has grown, so during the boom times, the number of people employed in trucking and transport increases, once you start to get that turn, that, that rate of change going backwards has been a signal in 1990, 2001, 2002, 2007, 2008, even during COVID, that things were starting to get a bit challenging. So for me, don't bet the farm on these kinds of data sets, but given the space that we play in, especially around B2B tech, when your customers are entering constrained environments, and if we do start to see interest rates start to bite and we do start to see corporate profits come back and budgets come back, it means that we're going to have to really belt. And so a lot of the founders that I'm interacting with, they're not basing their decisions just on recessionary potential, but their clients more and more are tightening their belts. More mm. and more there isn't that free and easy budget to go and put new stuff into commission. And tracking this kind of data is just... It's early warning signs that if history is to be repeated, and sometimes it doesn't, we are entering an environment where we will start to see some pullback in economic conditions, which is totally rational. Yeah. What is really interesting about this chart is how, like that cliff there, that's quite a significant drop, like sharp, sorry, not the size of the drop yet, but the sharp turnaround, very similar to the COVID era. And so yeah. it's just, anyway, just a random. I love it. Absolutely love it. 
trucking employment data. There you go. I'll put that in the put that in the show notes. Then segueing into companies and corporate cultures, there was a AFR article out around Air Wallex. Yeah, so this came on the back of a glass dosed by an employee. So glass door where employees can give reviews of companies and disclose salary information and whatnot. And one of the comments was from an employee or former employee, the first company to make me believe suicide is the best course of action, which is quite a scathing and also concerning yeah. review. So we don't want to make light of that particular comment because that's obviously serious, but it wasn't just a one-off comment. Yeah. The article went deep into a lot of comments, a lot of reviews. And I think one team, the marketing team was losing people quicker than they could hire them. And yep. their staff turnover, I think, was put it around about 14%, which yep. you've got to put a contextual. So I'm, I've got some involvement in the childcare industry and that turnover yearly for, I don't know, the better part of 15 years has been over 20%. You yep. can get it around 20%. You're doing pretty well because it is a really challenging environment. Yeah, and that, that was 14% quarterly. But yeah, particularly with Airwallex, this has come up previously back in mid-2021. There was a lot of commentary about their culture and employee dissatisfaction, and they said they would make changes and put things in place. And going back to one of our previous podcast episodes where we talked about staff incentives and all sorts of workplace programs and all of that was introduced, but it didn't, well, it appears it hasn't actually solved the cultural issue. It's nice to have those perks, but like we said in the last episode, it, it doesn't actually improve organizational culture and employee satisfaction. Yeah. And when I look at stories like this, obviously very difficult for the employees involved, but actually all companies go through this phase of what we would describe as internal disintegration, where because the growth has been so rapid, sometimes you don't develop in a healthy manner. And what ends up happening is you get these unhealthy manifestations or, or symptoms these are the symptoms that they're describing, but it's very hard to build a company that doesn't have even small versions of this. I'm not suggesting that what's described here is optimal or totally normal, but in that adolescence phase of the life cycle, which we talked about in previous episodes, you end up having this culture of high turnover, a lot of disintegration, a lot of it becomes people orientated and mm -hmm. what you've got to try and do is put some rails to run on and implement some systems and process and frameworks that help you deal with that. Otherwise, what happens is you get this revolving door and what worked for them building the company to this point is now going to cause aggravation and grief. And so the, the big challenge with these life cycle transitions is actually learning what part of your past to keep and learning what do we need to change in how we go about doing things. Otherwise, what will happen is this will keep going until the company implodes. And we see it time and time again. There's only so long a company can handle this level of turnover, this level of disintegration, these kinds of articles. Because with these articles flying around and, and everything, how do you attract the best talent? After mm. a while, it's next to Im impossible. And yeah. so you've actually got to start going inward and you've got to lay new foundations. And that's what we summarize when we talk about a healthy organization and a healthy culture. And it is normal to sometimes become unhealthy. It is normal sometimes to have some developmental issues, but it then becomes abnormal if you can't acknowledge them. It becomes abnormal if you don't seek help. It becomes abnormal if you don't change what you're doing that has led to this and start a new path that's going to go and solve these issues. Yeah. And I, I think for me, one thing that's interesting, so Airwallex now is at $8.6 billion valuation. They, they recently uh, announced a $17 million profit for the year, 1400 staff planning to IPO last year. But Don, a lot of the, a lot of what you share with founders is these things, these like cancers that grow develop much earlier. And so I think founders can often say that that's a later problem, but your point is setting up the railroads 
to get this right from day one. So I guess what's, what is something that a, an early stage founder can do to prevent these problems from arising? With them looking at IPOing or any company IPOing, IPOing is climbing a whole new mountain. Now, if you're a highly fit and healthy individual with all the energy and all your limbs are working and you've got all that strength, then the climb may be tough, but you'll be able to do it. If you're about to start a climb like that and you're unhealthy, you're smoking six packs a day, you've got a broken leg, you're carrying 50 kilos too much, you're arguing with everyone around you, there's a good chance you're going to fall off that mountain at some point. Mm. And so the first thing we've got to do, whether it's IPOing or expanding into a new country or just solving the day-to-day -day issues, the first thing we want to do is concentrate on getting healthy. And so any founder that's feeling that we may not be fully healthy, that maybe we could be better before starting to run the marathon, jump on the treadmill a bit and get a few things moving. Now that sort of says, okay, where do we go to from there? Then the next theoretical framework is that it all will come back to really strong trust and respect, both in yourself and with those that are around you. And if we look at what's happening here in this article, there is an absence of trust and respect. There mm. is an absence of that ingredient occurring. And that absence is so strong that it's now resulting in these glass door scathing attacks. Mm. And so what we've got to be able to do is get trust and respect really strong. Now, some practical examples, you've actually got to get everybody together. And I suggest an external facilitator for this. Yeah. I personally can help our portfolio. We, we can help our portfolio, but it's really hard to help yourself. Yeah. It's really hard. There's a reason why a lawyer never represents themselves. There's a reason why a surgeon never operates on their own child. It's actually really difficult. And during these periods of time, the default should be who, who can I find to help implement this before having any conversations. And then what that person's first step is, you've just got to get everything on the table. And often what you're just trying to do is get everybody to be able to have their say and to be able to put it in their own words. And then you need to be able to categorize what people have said into a range of different categories. Because sometimes they'll be cultural, sometimes they'll be humanistic, sometimes they'll be operational, sometimes they'll be strategic. You actually need to put them all together. So then that way you can put a skewer through it and, and see what's causing what. Because until you do that, you don't really know where to start. And what we then try and overlay is where you should start is what's abnormal for your phase of the life cycle. There are some things for where these guys are and all of our portfolio are that feel terrible, that feel awful. And they look, we look at other companies and say, there's no way that they could be experiencing this. So there must be something wrong with us. But actually, it's really hard to see what someone else is going through. And a lot of the stuff will actually be quite normal. And your role isn't to try and get rid of those things directly. Your role is to help the company mature, become healthy, where those issues fall away. Where you need to put your effort is what's abnormal. What are, yeah. what are the things that are really going to hold you back? And again, having a categorization tool, and there's a range of them. And, and we use one with our portfolio. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot in it. I, I think... That, that video you shared with Ishak at Deezy is talking about healthy growth versus non-healthy growth and taking that time to reintegrate and almost focus back internally and make sure the foundations are there. I think it's so incredibly valuable. And the analogy of climbing a mountain for me, like I always had this thing in the back of my mind, I'd love to climb Mount Everest. And Ben Southall, who's an amazing human, multi-world record holding adventurer, he spent three months at Everest Base Camp filming a documentary of, of all those climbers going up to Everest. And he shared, I was chatting to him about it and he said that the problem with Everest is you can be fully fit, have done all of your training, have all the right gear, do everything 100% right and still die. And it, it's a great business analogy. Well, I shouldn't say great when people, there's death involved, but it's a, there's a business Relevant. analogy there. Relevant yeah. analogy, yeah, that... In business, externalities and change are inevitable. Like these, these crises occur. And if we are spending energy on internal issues, that energy cannot be used on, on dealing with the external because we all have finite energy, finite resources. So 
that exact exactly what you described is, is so powerful in that we need to make sure that we have the right ingredients internally, the right frameworks, the, the structures to be able to, to focus on those externalities, but that changes over time and we need to then rebuild those foundations internally in the organisation to deal with them. And if I think through it a bit, maybe there's a bit of a lesson here. So when my brother and I own a farm together and his big brother, i.e. me, has a history of being a bit of a dick and <laughs> we didn't see eye to eye on a, on a couple of things, but I brought in someone from Adesis actually, Daniil from the American office, just to facilitate a conversation and that really helped us. So now that I think through it, it's almost if you really want to do the best you can to be ready for the inevitable storm or the weather, maybe have that chosen early on. Know who you'll call, have it agreed that you will call for when that is required. So that's just come to me now in terms of the thing of being proactive. When the inevitable storm comes and you're trying to cling on to the, to the face of Everest, using that analogy, who's that person that's, that as a team or whoever, even as an individual, is going to help you lay down those rails to get out because when you're in the painting, you can't see the whole picture. Yeah, really powerful. And it also ties back to why we do things like the offsite. Our offsite in November is focused on scaling and growth, but founders often associate scaling and growth to mean that's all about our, our marketing and our sales and driving our sales teams to particular KPIs, whereas so much of the focus of our offsites is actually foundational. Looking at your organizational structure, having the, the tools that you introduced on, like PIPs, like these methods for problem identification, separate or identifying what's normal and abnormal for your stage, and then actually allocating that to people to resolve because it's not BAU activities and it's not just growth at any expense, but making sure you're taking these short little time out moments to make sure your, your foundations are solid. And so it's interesting when talking to founders about what do we cover at the offsite and, and their expectation versus what we cover. Yeah, make, making sure that you've got the foundations for that success making sure you've got all of those different ingredients and then understanding that once you start climbing Everest, there will be some people that are lucky that get bluebird powder days that climb to the top. And then there'll be some people that are unlucky that get hit by the storm. And we can't do anything about that except for do the best we can on our health and from an organization, making sure our culture is as strong as it can. Our foundations are as strong as it can. And some are blessed with luck and some aren't but you can't control that bit. Yeah. And some of us only make it to base camp and even then have altitude sickness and crap our pants the entire day. And are you just, are you sharing for a friend or? No, I had a total fail making it to Everest base camp. Like it's just the starting point for most people going to actually summit. And I, I had severe altitude sickness on, on the final day of the, the walk and, and that night. And it was horrendous. Like, Loss of body control. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And that's really good sharing. And I'm glad that Jack and I can sort of understand <laughs> that. But yeah, trying to keep that analogy going a little bit. Sometimes in the early stage of business, that happens. What is it? The bumper sticker says shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, it's literal sometimes. But absolutely, shit happens. And the and when if you have that high trust and respect environment, if you have the frameworks, the tools, you have the go to people on standby to call and and talk you through it, give you perspective through it. They're the bits that you have to have in place before shit happens. So I don't know where else you go after. <laughs> where do you, you've took the conversation down a different direction. <laughs> you've got to the point of disclosing and shitting your pants. I don't, I don't know where we go. I think. Yeah, there's probably nowhere. Yeah. I, I think quite a skill for ending a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, what are we looking forward to? Oh, good question. Jack, you kick us off. I'm looking forward to heading back to Brisbane tomorrow, catching up with you guys for lunch. Yeah, we've got lunch. Yep, looking forward to that. And then this weekend, just pack my bags because I'm off to France for the World Cup. But I won't be packing the Wallabies jersey. That's the only looking forward to it. Yeah, who, who will you be going for as a substitute? I'm going to go for the Irish. Okay. Like to be sure, Irish. to be sure. Don, what are you looking forward to? It's Matilda's birthday, so we've got the jumping castle organised and we've got both sides of the family coming over and I've got family in from the UK 
And so that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. And I am a month away from a triathlon, but haven't been in the pool for, I don't know how many months, nor have I run, I don't know in how many weeks. So I'm going to cram months worth of training into Sunday. Does that help me, isn't it? That's the way you do it. You, you, yeah, that's totally how it works. Absolutely. Sounds like our marathon train. I did do a 10K run last week and I was incredibly sore afterwards. So <laughs> I've declined quickly. I'm looking forward to a, a weekend at home with the kids. So it'll be a, a nice, quiet one and catching up on a whole heap of work, which for me is actually quite exciting. All right. I look forward to seeing you both tomorrow in person at the office. I'll see you there. See you guys. Right.